there's another generation coming up behind them. How many grandchildren does Mommy have? Mommy has 33 grandchildren, and she wants more. <laughs> as far as she seems to. Your song. <laughs> <laughs> Rory, many congratulations uh, on the film and of course on the uh, Emmy nominations. Um, it really is a pleasure as well that you've agreed to do the Q&A afterwards. Um, first of all, how many times did you have to ask your mother before she said yes to do the film? Well, I will answer that in one second, but I do want to just take a moment to thank you all for coming here this evening. It's really such a pleasure and an honor to show this film that is such a personal film here in Ireland, um, so close to the place where my great, great, great uncle left here to come to America. So it's really a special evening for me and for my family. So I want to acknowledge my cousin Teddy and Kiki Kennedy who are here and my husband Mark Bailey who, who came in from the United States and we're so thrilled to be here. Um, and I also want to thank you. <laughs> and I want to thank Noel and Sean Reedy for putting this event together and the, the Kennedy School and all the staff and everybody who's sustaining this program which is just so extraordinary and incredible to all of us and we're so thrilled as a family and so we, we thank you all and we thank you for talking to me tonight. Um, so to answer your question, really what happened um, was that I've been making documentaries now for about 20 years, 25 years, and I've made a lot of documentaries with HBO and they had approached me to do this documentary about my mother. They, People have asked me to do films about my family over the years and I've always said no because it's too personal and I, I want to stick with issues that are kind of outside of my own experience and try to bring some attention to them. And 
but they were very insistent on it. And you know, after a while, I thought, well, okay, fine. I'll just ask my mother, and she'll say no because she hates doing interviews, as you can see, and she doesn't like talking about herself. And there's no part of this process that she would enjoy. So I was certain she would say no. And I asked her once. I called her on the phone, and I said, I know you're going to say no to this. You really don't have to do it, but HBO, you know, they would like you to do this documentary with me on, on you. And she said yes. <laughs> and I was shocked. And I was like, really? Are you sure? Although one of the things I think that we learned from the film uh, is that your mother does like to be contrary. So do you think that uh, perhaps she was teasing you when she said yes to do the film and perhaps she thought that you might back out? Uh, well, I think we both at that point had kind of, once we, once we said yes, we were both committed. And, 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 uh, and she stuck with it, you know, the whole way through. And she was really incredible, I think, to do it because she is, it is so antithetical to everything that she does and believes and is as a person to sit down for, I mean, she can't really sit for that long, first of all, because she gets antsy and she really doesn't like talking about herself or reflecting on these things or thinking of herself as important enough to even have a film made about her. And, um, and so it's very uncomfortable for her, but she did it. So you said that uh, one of the things that uh, kind of had been pushed on you in some ways over a number of years was to do something on your family. What was it that was actually special to you about doing this film about your mother? Um, for example, why, at any stage, did you think about making the film about your father? Well, you know, I had my siblings and I and other family members had talked to my mother in the previous five years or so, encouraging her to write a book. Um, and I, you know, we know her as a character and as, you know, a, a person who's been involved in the, the front lines of so many of these extraordinary historical events and seen it, you know, really from the front lines and, and, and been such an extraordinary witness. And not only that, but it has had influence in, in what has happened in our history. And so I think we all felt like she had something to say and that she should say it. But there was no way she was going to write a book for the same reasons I just said. So, so you know, I did feel after she said yes, and I thought about it, and I talked to my husband Mark, who is, was really my partner in making this, and he wrote this film along with many of my other films. And you know, I said I, I absolutely wouldn't do it without him, but he agreed. He agreed to be involved. But you know, I did feel that. If we didn't do this, it wouldn't get done. And that there was something to be said. And, and you know, it wasn't, my resistance was not, oh, there's not a great story here. My resistance was, I'm going to have to ask her very difficult questions that I don't want to ask her. And I'm going to have to explore a lot of these issues that make her uncomfortable, make my siblings uncomfortable, make me uncomfortable. Then I'm going to have to make a film about it, make it work as a film, and it's a lot. And how did you find uh, interviewing your siblings? And I have to say, one of my favourite moments in the whole film is uh, when one of your brothers counts through the children and says, "Well, there are ten, there are only yeah, ten. That's my but that was. kind of, uh, that, that, did you have to put up with a lot of that kind of teasing? Well, there was the a certain amount of teasing, film. some of which I, I preserved for your <laughs> enjoyment. Um, but, you know, I have to say, it was real. I mean, it was, on some level, it was slightly mixed because it is, some of the territory is hard and, and sad, and it's hard to ask my siblings, you know, with camera, and all, it's just hard to ask them about these sad moments that nobody particularly wants to talk about in any in any format. And but because I'm the youngest of eleven, you know, my sister Kathleen, who's the oldest, and my older siblings Joe, Bobby, David, Courtney, you know, they had such a different experience than I did growing up, and then you kind of grow up and there's never really the opportunity, you know, you ask questions here and there and you find out things this way and that way, but you never really sit down and say, so what happened? What was this like? How did this happen? How did you feel when this happened? So it was such an honor and, so, you know, I feel like it was such a gift to be able to sit with them and to get their perspective, you know, on a range of things from what it was like 
going to the same school we went to, how they woke up in the morning, what it was like on the Cape, what their routine was, and in some ways it was exactly the same as mine. And two, what was it like to live through some of these, you know, more historical events like the Hoffa hearings or the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, that I was too young for and not alive for and had never really sat down and asked them all, you know, methodically what was that like, you know, and, and to get that perspective on those events, I found really insightful and interesting and, and uh, you know, worthy of being in a film, I guess. Did you, did you find that, that perhaps that helped with your detachment? Because one of the hardest things in this film for you must have been that some of your previous films have been quite hard hitting, for example, on Abbey Grave, and that these kind of things. In this one, this is a much more personal film for you. So how did you balance being both objective and making a film that is personal and about your family? Right. I mean, it was hard. It was very hard to have perspective on it. One of the things I did is put myself in it and, you know, from the beginning to say that this is really a POV film, you know, this is a film that I am telling you from the inside out of what it was like to live in my family. So if you're coming in here to expect an objective film about Ethel Kennedy, this, that's not what you're going to get, but hopefully you'll get something else that nobody else has been able to provide and some insight will come along with it. But it doesn't have the pretense to be, you know, an objective film with the word of, you know, the narrator of the voice of God in there, that it's, it's very much, this is my experience and what it was like for me from my perspective. I think um, it was J. Edgar Hoover who thought he was the voice of God. Yes. Um, yes. Did, did you find that but, the, the mark was useful sometimes in saying, well, hang on, we just need to take a step back here? Um, yeah, he doesn't really talk like that, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yes, he was hugely crucial, and that voice was hugely important, because I'd be like, oh, look at that little cute little animal, and it's my little pet, it's so cute, let's keep him in there. <laughs> Oh, we can't keep Spanky in the film. <laughs> you know, but I mean, you know, it's a shame. I know, Spanky was so cute. But, you know, it would range from very personal things that I was connected to, to having a kind of perspective of what people know and don't know and what kind of, you know, it was a challenge and always a pull in this film to tell my father's story because he's the public figure and he's the people the figure people know and her story is so linked to his story and what makes her story interesting in large part is his story and so but i wanted it to be really through her eyes and not you know if i was going to make a film about my father it would be a very different film than what this is and i wanted it to really interweave and have my mother's perspective, have her character, have the kids have a voice. And I didn't feel like I could do that if it was the story of Robert Kennedy. So it was there was a constant pull for us in the edit room to kind of weave in the events that were relevant and that people could identify with and then pull back to what my mother's experience or what was happening at the Hickory Hill at the time and kind of weave that throughout. But um, and, you know, so that that was a balance, which was also a challenge. And Mark had, a, I think, a, a continual um, leveled voice in kind of helping to understand what people needed to know and what they didn't know, and when we needed, when we could jump back to my mother's story, and when we needed to move away from it. And you know, that was a constant um, struggle with the film. I think one of the things that uh, really struck me when I was watching the film was the importance of the scapegoat side of the of that relationship. That yeah. you know, that seemed to introduce a, a kind of a level of informality that your father enjoyed, and which really, in, in many ways, was a defining spirit of the whole, of the whole family for all eleven of you eventually. Yes, and I think um, you know there's there's a, still a lot of scapegoat in all of us, and, and we're proud what's, of that. what's the scapegoat in you? Um, well, you know, I think that there is a um, comfortable sense of questioning authority that we all have in my family, and, uh, and I think I, I might have a little of that and, and encourage it in my children too, but you know, um, 
my cousin or my aunt, Pat Skakel, who had dated my father, then moved here outside of Dublin and married Lewin Cuff, and a number of our uh, Skakel cousins live in and around Dublin and outside of it. So it's, it's nice to have family still here. And do you steal horses? Uh, and steal horses sometimes, <laughs> only, only when they're starving. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, again, one of the things that kind of really comes out of the film is the idea of the importance of women in politics. That in, in, in many ways, the, the film begins with the Kennedy Tea Parties that uh, helped to get Jack Kennedy elected in, from 1946 onwards. And your mother becomes a part of that. It's clear from the film that she was like a duck to water. Uh, she absolutely loved the whole business of campaigning and politics, maybe in a way that uh, even your father didn't in some ways. I think she did, you know, I think there's um, a, a number of members of my family who really do just enjoy campaigning, and, and then there are other people who don't enjoy it so much, and it's, there is a, um, you know, you have a kind of a knack for it, and a, and a real interest in going out in the world and meeting people and learning about people and, and being on the ground, and I think my mother, just one of the things that I love about her is her love of people. Um, and, you know, it's demonstrated on the campaign trail, but it's, you see it every day in the way that she interacts and her general curiosity and, and how she interacts with people, and I think it's really wonderful. You know, I think that um, she did grow up at a, in a certain age in our country in a certain time frame where women didn't run for office. Um, and I think that, I'm not sure that she was and is of the nature of somebody who would want to run for office directly. I don't think that was, um, that's who she is. It may be because of when she grew up and had she grown up, you know, 50 years later that she would feel comfortable with that. I think there are other women in our family, um, you know, I would say my aunt Eunice Kennedy Shriver is somebody who I could absolutely have seen running for office and, and, and uh, doing extremely well. Um, but, but probably it came before her age, and uh, you know, and so women took a different role then than they can now, and that's testimony to the women's rights movement and all the changes that have been made over the last 50 years. And I, I, I suppose everyone here would want me to ask whether you've ever considered running for office yourself. Um, I, right now, am not interested in running for office. I really, really enjoy making documentary films, and that's what I'm continuing to do, and um, I won't say, you know, 15 years from now how I'll feel about that, but right now I'm, I'm, not, I'm not interested in jumping in, but um, I think there are other members of my family who would be fantastic, such as Teddy. <laughs> I think we just had an announcement right there. <laughs> <now. laughs> it just didn't, if he was interested, I think he would be really amazing. So, uh, I mean, one of the, uh, one of, <laughs> I, don't know, I, I don't know whether perhaps I should ask him if he's going to say anything at this, uh, at this moment. Um, obviously, kind of a lot of the film deals with the really tumultuous events of the, of, of the, of the 1960s. And it, the, one of the things that comes out very strongly in the film is the relationship that your father had with his brother, President Kennedy. Uh, is, is that something that your siblings and that your mother talked about once you were old enough to um, start having these kind of conversations? What were the memories as you were growing up of President Kennedy and the relationship which you had with your father. Right. Well, of course, all of them preceded me, so so I don't have any direct memories, but. Um, but that's um, right. I, I mean, their... what did they tell you right. of um, of you know, President Kennedy and being around the president? And right. The president well, there was, absolutely was a sense that they were very, very close, and you know, I mean, there are a lot of areas in the film that. Um, we weren't able to cover, and uh, my father also had a very close relationship with Teddy, and, and as did Jack, and they were a very close family, I think very tight-knit overall, um, and they really uh, supported each other, and they campaigned for each other, and they you know, really got behind each other and worked very hard for each other, and, and I think there was that, that sense growing up 
um, was very real. And you know, in Hyannis Ford, um, Jack's house was right next to ours. Teddy's house is next door. The Shriver's house is a mile down the road. Jean Kennedy's house was across the street. You know, so we grew up very close to each other, and that's very close knit family. On the, at the next generation, if you go to the Cape during the summer now, there's you know 75 to 100 cousins running around. You know, all of our siblings and my cousins' siblings. I mean, it's really extraordinary, and and I think you know still to this day because of that culture of the importance of family, it's translated itself down through the generations, and I think you can see it. Um, and how it man manifests itself today. So, you know, I guess my point was that it, the emphasis may not have been the connection between my father and Jack, although there was there was a specialness between their relationship. But you know, it was it was the aunts and my other uncles and the in-laws. I mean, it was just a very very tight knit family overall. But it, it, it must have been very strange for you as well as you were growing up. For example, when you were in school studying history. And so much of what you were studying was also your family history as well. How, what was that like for you? Well, that, you know, I think that's, um, that was always a little bit of a struggle or tension as you're, you're on, in my younger years in high school trying to kind of figure out who you are and, and what you're reading and how that, you know, translates. And, um, but of course, I feel like I've been so lucky to be raised in the family that I grew up in and um, over the years have really, really, you know, and, and during that time too, very much appreciated my family, but there's always, you know, there's always questions because of the legacy and because of the impact that so many members of the older generation have had, you know, what can I do? And you're kind of up against a, a, a pretty ginormous shadow, but once you kind of get over that and find your groove, I like making documentaries and I'm pretty comfortable with that at this point. So it, it is, it, is that, is that fair to say then that in some ways there's a there's a privilege, but there's also a kind of because of the sense of expectation that balance is. I don't think there's very any difficult. expectation that comes internally from my family. I don't think there's never been a time where you know my mother has said you need to do this because you know your father was this. I mean, and I've never heard those words uttered by anybody inside my family. But I think there's a natural. Um, inclination to kind of gauge yourself against what's come in, you know, before you. And so I think all of us, it's natural to sort of question, well, what am I doing? What am I contributing? How am I giving back? Is this enough? Should I be doing more? You know, and I think it's probably a natural enough question that, that everybody asks to some degree. And, and you know, th these figures are, are, are rather large, but I think they also, um, you know, inspire all of us to do anything that we can. So you don't have to be the president and you don't have to change the world events. You can make a difference inside of your family or inside of your community or, you know, inside of yourself. And that, that is, that's a contribution. So in some ways it's, it's rather like the letter that your father sent to your sister where he told her that you have to work for your country. Yeah. In that broader sense. Yeah, you have to, I mean, I think there's definitely a sense in our family that we've been given a lot, that we've had a lot of privilege, and that it's nice to give back, and it's and it's um, important to look outside of ourselves, all the other experiences, and see if we can, you know, make a difference and, and, and contribute. Um, but that said, I don't, you know, nobody in my family has ever said, you must do this, or you, you know, you have to go, you can't go get a job that pays money, or, you know, there's no judgment in that. So it's, it's a sense that we're all lucky, and you know any contribution that we can make is, is important, and it's important to look outside of yourself and not stay in your own head too much. I think it's really healthy for all of us. As, as, as you say, very lucky, but also there's been a great deal of tragedy in, in the family, and you cover that in the film. Um, obviously, I don't want to be invasive about this, but it must have been very, very difficult for you as it was when we saw in that very moving section uh, of the film for, for you to um, film this section about the assassination of your father. That must have been a very difficult for you and very difficult for you dealing and interviewing your mother over that. Yeah, it was hard. It was hard. Um, you know, as you can see, my mother doesn't 
dwell on these moments. She's very much somebody who lives in the present and, and is forward thinking, as is, I think, all my siblings. And so, you know, I, I think that on the, in the outside world, there's a lot of focus on these very tragic moments. But from within my family, it's not something that, that we really dwell on. Um, and I think it's difficult in part because of that to ask questions about it and um, ask my mother about it, which I know is very difficult for her and it's uncomfortable for me, frankly. So it wasn't something that um, I enjoyed, but I felt like I needed to do it. And, uh, um, you know, it's, it's part of her story. And so I think both of us knew when I asked her if she wanted to do this film that I'd have to ask her those questions. And what, what kind of... Um Emotions do you go through, for example, when you watch your father give that magnificent speech in Indianapolis? But or what do you? Uh, um, what's what's the, what are the kind of feelings that that kind of conjures up, and the kind of sense that getting to really know him as a man, but also yeah. seeing him as a, as his public figure? Well, it's such an amazing moment because you know he he got off the plane to campaign, and then it found out that Martin Luther King been assassinated and um, had been shot and he was really discouraged to continue. He was told to go to his hotel room and then get back on the plane and nobody um, thought that he should go and give a speech and um, he had a speechwriter who when he decided he was going to go give the speech, he had a speechwriter in his car with him who was writing, writing away and he didn't even look at it and he just stepped out of the car and he got on the stage. And he thought that most of the people knew, but it turned out that you know he had, he was the one who had to tell them. And so it's such a raw moment, and I think it's because of that really considered one of the great political speeches of all time because it so genuinely comes from his heart. And you know I think that um, there's a lot of talk about my father and in the film about you know him having processed the loss of my Uncle Jack and having gone to very dark places and reading all of these books and learning about it and really going into that darkness. And then I think, you know, the result of that is that speech is being able to have a moment like that where you can speak to people so genuinely and that it translates so clearly mm -hmm. that it's from a person who has to also experience loss and pain. Mm -hmm. One of the, um, the the other characters who's on the uh, somewhat on the sidelines of the of the film is Jackie Kennedy, who seems to be a very contrasting kind of figure uh, to your mother. Um, but what, what was their relationship like? You know, my mother and Jackie always were very friendly with each other and had a lot of um, love and respect for each other, and, and they both had a really great sense of humor, which they appreciated in one another and. Um, I think that they were very different personalities, but um, Jackie was a big part of our life growing up, and uh, as I said, she you know, had a house next door to us on the Cape, and she also lived in the vineyard, and she would invite our entire family over every summer. And um, You know, I think that, uh, the, as they say, they were different people, but they were always very loving towards each other and, and, and fond of each other, and I think that, um, overwhelmingly a very close, positive relationship. So if there was one thing that you wanted us to take away from the film about your mother, what would that, what would that thing be? What would be the single thing that you would most like us to take away? Well, I think, um, you know, there's so many things, but um, I guess it goes back to my mother's uh, love of humanity and her love of people and how that drives so much of who she is, why she had so many children, um, why she loved my father, so why she was um, driven to politics, why she loved politics, uh, that it was a place that she felt like she could be with people, that she could reach people, she could make an impact on people's lives. And, um, and I think her commitment ever since my father has uh, has has died has shown her genuine interest in making a difference in, in people's lives.
Well, I think you can tell from the warmth of the reaction that we had here this evening that it's a, it's a wonderful film. It was a real it was a thrill for all of us to be able to uh, watch it in, in your presence, to have you here, uh, and for you to take the questions tonight. Ladies and gentlemen,